necessarily experts in solar physics. Um, we, can, we can ask that question, why does the sun vary? What we can't do, of course, is answer the question yet. <laughs> um, and so what our vision is, is to, put, is to expand our understanding of the sun to develop a capability to actually make forecasts of activity cycles and of the magnetic field variability. And even though we're not gonna do that in sort of a practical, you know, gonna test it in 20 years put away, maybe, um, but we are gonna be able to predict variability on shorter time scales as well. And we wanna do that by creating a diverse and inclusive center of excellence in solar physics. So those are lofty words, but what's the actual science that we want to do? Well, let's see if I can get it to go the right direction. Here are our uh, science goals, if I got it right. Yes, here are our science questions. Um, and these are the things that sort of help focus us on what we want to do and give us a vision for where we want to go in the long run. And so the first one is what drives the varying large scale motions on the sun, uh, such as meridional flow and differential rotation. Uh, those are things that we can see at the surface, but they also carry on underneath the surface and are the things that really lead to um, our second question, which is how do those flows interact with magnetic fields to create varying activity cycles. Um, the sun, of course, you know, has cycles that last 11 years um, or 22 years if you actually take the polarity into account. Um, but we don't understand in, a, in fully, at least, uh, how those motions uh, are affected by uh, the magnetic fields and how the magnetic fields affect those motions in turn to, to develop the cycles that we have. And then focusing in just a little bit more narrowly, what causes active regions to emerge when and where they do during the solar cycle? So we know that there's a progression from, high lati from mid latitudes to low latitudes as the cycle progresses. Um, but we also know that sunspots and active regions emerge in clusters um, or nests. And we don't really understand why that is. We don't understand where they're actually originating, how deep is it, how, how stable is it, how things change. And we don't understand that emergence process and why they emerge in the way they do exactly. Why are some magnetic fields twisted? Why are some twisted in the direction pointing towards you? Why are some of them tilted on the surface of the sun? And then I think one of the ways for real growth is how is our understanding of solar activity informed by fields and flows on other stars? Uh, we can, of course, make the measurements uh, of um, other stars in the same way that we do uh, of the sun because we can't resolve everything, but there are a lot, there's a lot of new information from all of these great satellites out there telling us about how other stars behave and what their activity cycles are like. And we can, should be able to, and we can uh, learn a lot, and we'll do that a little bit later today, um, learn a lot about what the sun is doing based on those activities. So, um, so we've based ourselves or we've divided ourselves now into different themes. And this is something that emerged in the process of organizing our thinking for the next few years. And we're gonna focus on three basic processes or three basic areas of the sun that all work together. The first is the tachycline. The tachycline is at the base of the convection zone. That's this, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but at the bottom of the convection zone, there's a place where the, the shear changes or the, the motions change from a rigid rotating core to a differentially rotating uh, convection zone. And what happens there is we think very important for generating the magnetic field. The second question or the second theme is flux transport and emergence. Um, the flux is emerged from this low great depth to the surface. How does that actually happen? What are the convective processes um, that are moving things? Why do things and why is emergence initiated? And how is the flux transported from deep in the interior toward the surface? And then, of course, once it gets to the surface, how does it move around? And that's the, both the flux transport, so then within the convection zone and the emergence onto the surface and then the subsequent disposition of it. And then finally, there's this a near surface shear layer, which if I can point over here, is, is concentrated near the surface of the sun. And you can also see it here where there's a change in the rate of rotation, which is really what happens is the, 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 the Plasma is rotating at a different rate, very near the surface compared to a greater depth. And that near surface shear layer is likely the seat of additional magnetic field amplification and dispersal. 
And we feel that there's a real mystery there. We don't understand that process very well. We don't understand that region of the sun very well, but we think it's important, particularly for how things move around once they get near the surface and, and for affecting the transport and the emergence from, from deeper in the interior. And so this is one of the focuses. It's also one of the places that we should be able to use our better measurements from the helioseismology to explore what's going on inside the sun. So we've um, listed a, a number of milestones in each of these different areas, the tachycline at the top, the flux emergence in the middle, and the near surface shear layer on the bottom. And I'm not gonna read through all of these questions, but the idea is to understand, and, and we think these are all achievable milestones, achievable tasks that we, can achieve, that we can accomplish in the next few years by working together. So for example, in flux emergence, we can characterize the physical mechanisms underlying emergence and decay. We can determine the origin and evolution of magnetic helicity, and we can understand what activity nests reveal about flux emergence. If we put that together with improved understanding of the near surface layer, layer and the tachycline, then we should be able to make real progress on our big science questions. Um, we've organized ourselves so far into teams, and these teams are sort of based on our traditional disciplines, but we're working together now on these themes, um, which bring people together from the different science teams. Um, but we've organized ourselves initially into these teams because we're sort of familiar with it and it, and it gives us sort of a basis and it, and it forms the basis of our expertise and the techniques that we're going to use together um, as we make progress. There are five teams. One is the dynamo team and it really has to do with understanding um, how the sun and stars generate the magnetic activity cycles. There's the convection team, which is really focused on um, the deep interior. Um, and fully 3D model, models of solar and stellar interior dynamics. Um, helioseismology is a technique that we use to measure things in the interior of the sun. Um, and we want to improve the reliability and focus our activities on understanding better the regions that are, are mysterious to us at this point. Um, the surface links team is, focuses on things that we can observe at the surface but our intent in coffees is to establish the physical links between the things that we see near the surface with what's happening deep inside. And then one of the things that we realized over the last year or two was that we really need to be able to integrate all of these things together. And there are, are specific problems or specific issues that we have in trying to get different models to talk to each other. And so we have a model integration team that does that too. And I've listed here the leaders of those people, of those teams, um, in case any of you know them or would like to get in touch with us. Now, let's see if I can get to the next one. So we put it all together um, in this final form here. And if I could see the top line, I can tell you what it said. <laughs> but the, the idea here is that the science questions at the top provide a motivation and understanding for what we want to do. And so those four science questions that we talk about lead to the themes, the tachycline, flux emergence, and near surface shear layer where we can make real scientific project progress on the re, on the air, in the areas that we need in order to accomplish our goal, which is listed on the right there, which is a combined model of large scale and, uh, and small scale fields and flows that help us understand the origins of the solar cycle and why flux emerges the way it does. And then at the bottom there, just again, showing that we use those teams um, to accomplish that work. So this is kind of our culminating big organization thing. Um, we have a couple of other groups that are working as well. One is the center effectiveness team, and this one has been instrumental in helping us learn to work together during both times of COVID and also times of being separated from each other. One more minute, large... Pardon? One more minute. Yeah, that's about right. Um, so we have center effectiveness. Uh, there are a lot of challenges. Um, the, I've listed them there, and those are sort of some common ones that we know about. And the CET helps us um, through exercises where we talk about things to understand some of the things that we want to do. And there's a nice poster on Friday by um, Shay Hessweber. Um, on, in, uh, so take a look at that if you have a chance. Um, coffees, diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. Um, we're strongly committed to those goals that are listed here. We really want to um, increase our uh, visibility and the um, provide pathways for people from diverse backgrounds um, and also reach out to those who, um, who we can reach. 
Um, and then finally, um, workforce development and STEM engagement. We have um, early career mentorship. We have a research experiences for undergraduates program. And then we also have a, a public outreach and informal science thing uh, project that is focusing primarily on science on sphere activities, which are really exciting. And then our, our, our uh, team here is listed and I won't go into that because I'm kind of out of time, but we have an organizational team we call our team leaders baristas because we're kind of having fun with the coffees thing. Um, and we um, look forward to getting to know you guys a little bit better. And if there's anything we can do to um, find ways to include you in coffees, it's not closed team. Only some of us are funded, but we're delighted um, if more of you can join in and, and participate in the science. Thanks, Todd. Um... Uh, feel free to uh, stick around and ask questions about coffees as a center later after the science talks. Um, we'll, we'll open up for Q&A. Um, so like I said earlier, the theme for um, this, um, this Coffee with Coffees is the solar cycle. So we're going to have two science talks, one on the solar cycle and surface manifestations and drivers of the solar cycle, and the second is going to be focused uh, well, actually, sorry, no, the first one is going to be the interior talk. The second one is going to be the surface talk. Um, so for the interior, we are pleased to have one of our early career scientists participating in coffees, Sushant Mahajan, um, and he's going to talk about surface manifestations. So take it away, Sushant. I'm going to talk about interior manifestations. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you know, it's been a long meeting already. <laughs> 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 All right, let me see if I can share my screen. Uh, presenter mode. Can you see my slides? Yep. Yeah. Okay. And let's just move to the Zoom panel. Okay, there we go. Whoops. All right. <clears throat> so I'm a postdoc at the University of Hawaii. Um, and uh, let's start with just the standard 411 years of sunspot numbers observed over time. So we've known now since 1843 when Schwab discovered an 11 year periodicity in, in sunspot numbers that sunspot numbers increase and decrease in cycles of 11 years, which we call sunspot cycle. And if you look at the bottom plot, which shows the distribution of these sunspots over time um, and latitude over the past for solar cycles, you can see sunspots at the beginning of the cycle start at high latitudes. And as you go ahead um, through the course of a sunspot cycle, newer sunspots appear at lower latitudes. Uh, the color in this plot represents the magnetic field. And you can see there is some polar field uh, to the sun, which changes polarities as well in cycles of 11 years. But that change in polarity is out of phase with the sunspot cycle. The polarity reversal happens near the poles when sunspot number is nearly at its maximum. Um, and this interplay uh, of the polar field um, and emergence of sunspots is, is what um, is an important manifestation on the surface of the sun of um, the solar dynamo operating in the interior. So what uh, what happens in the interior. There are two main uh, flow, flow profiles in the interior that uh, we need to understand um, if we're gonna study uh, how uh, magnetic field is produced in the interior. And as Todd uh, pointed out, the differential rotation of the sun um, is shown on this plot on the left, which uh, from the equator over here to the poles over here shows a latitudinal shear the equator rotating faster than the poles. And below this red dotted line, uh, that is the tachocline, the boundary uh, between the radiative and convective zone inside the sun. Uh, below the tachocline, the sun is pretty much a rigid rotator. Um, it doesn't uh, rotate uh, uh, differentially to the extent that it does uh, in the convective zone. Uh, and this, uh, differential rotation is what we think powers the, the solar magnetic cycle, and I'll cover how that happens later. On the right, we have uh, an, a weaker, a much weaker flow profile than the rotation rate of the sun. That's called the meridional circulation. On the surface, this 
meridional flow goes from the equator towards the poles in both hemispheres. The amplitudes are around 15 meters per second. And uh, it's, very, it's well observed on the surface now. Um, and it is, it, it is supposed to return back towards the equator um, in, in, deep in the interior of the sun. But the depth at which this return flow operates is, is kind of not well uh, understood yet. <clears throat> And this meridional circulation uh, in some models of the solar cycle uh, sets up the cycle period um, of 11 years. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to cover a cartoon understanding of, of the solar dynamo, putting together all the different aspects. Um, there are, this is not the only model of the solar cycle, but this is the one I understand the best, and it's one of the most popular ones. So let's start with a poloidal field going from south to north inside the sun. Um, and you have differential rotation acting on it. Now, the convection zone of the sun is a high beta plasma, wherein uh, flux seems to be frozen inside the plasma. So magnetic fields, the magnetic flux will move the way plasma moves. And if you have a differentially rotating interior uh, where the equator is rotating faster around the sun than the higher latitudes, what this will do to the magnetic field it will, is it'll start to curve the magnetic field and start wrapping it around the sun because the equator is going faster than the high latitudes. This changes the direction of the magnetic field it, from poloidal it makes it toroidal, uh, wrapped around the sun in the form of a torus. And it, in this process of stretching the magnetic field, the magnetic field itself is also amplified. Um, <clears throat> once you build up uh, uh, an enough amount of magnetic field in the form of these uh, flux tubes um, inside the sun, um, Eugene Parker in 1955 proposed that if this magnetic flux tube is in isothermal equilibrium with its surroundings, then the plasma density inside the magnetic flux tube has to be lower than its surroundings. And what happens if you have a low density pocket in the presence of gravity? That low density pocket is subject to Archimedes principle and it's subject to uh, buoyancy, which we call magnetic buoyancy in this case. Um, so the flux tube uh, within rises through the convection zone and pierces the photosphere of the sun at two locations forming two opposite polarity uh, sunspots. This region is typically called the bipolar magnetic region and sunspots typically are seen to observe, uh, are seen to appear in pairs. Um, while this flux tube is rising through the convection zone of the sun, because the sun itself is a rotating body, the, the flux tube is also subject to Coriolis force which imparts a particular tilt to these sunspot regions. And I'm sure Mark will cover uh, things concerning the tilt in his talk um, of surface manifestations. <clears throat> so um, once you have um, this magnetic flux tube rise up to the surface and create spots on the surface, the decay, uh, the spots that emerge decay in a fashion that ends up inverting the polar field. I won't cover this in detail because that's what Mark is going to do, uh, but you end up with an opposite polarity uh, magnetic field in the interior and the whole cycle starts again. All right, <clears throat> so what drives the solar dynamo? Uh, physically speaking. We, we saw the cartoon understanding, but let's look at the, the, the equations themselves. So the first equation here is the magnetic induction equation. I wouldn't spend a lot of time like uh, uh, concerning yourselves with what all these symbols mean. I'll explain uh, the terms that are important. Um, the first equation is the magnetic induction equation, and the second equation is the conservation of momentum equation, right? Now, uh, it's very complicated to understand the equations in this form. So an, an easier way to analyze these in the, in the solar interior on a macroscopic scale is to look at an integrated form of these equations. If you multiply the first equation, take its dot product with magnetic field. The second equation, you take, it, take its dot product with velocity and integrate it over the entire convection zone. 
you get an equation for the evolution of magnetic energy. Uh, this is integrated magnetic energy in the entire convection zone and an equation for the integrated kinetic energy in the entire convection zone, right? Now, our volume of integration stretches from slightly below the tidal plane, so slightly into the radiative zone, up to the photosphere of the sun. Now, let's analyze what, what we get for magnetic energy. What we're looking for is, is the source of this magnetic energy, what drives the solar cycle, right? So we need to identify which one of, which one of these terms can act as the source and which ones are, are sinks uh, that dissipate magnetic energy, right? <clears throat> Okay, so let's look at the third term. It's a surface integral of the pointing flux that's integrated over the bounding surfaces of this closed volume. And you have surface, uh, a surface that's below the tachocline and at the photosphere, right? Now below the tachocline, because we're into the radiative zone and the sun isn't, we don't think it produces magnetic field because there isn't a lot of uh, shear in rotation. Uh, in, in the radi radiation zone and below, we don't think there's any magnetic field manufactured below this that can come up uh, into the convective zone. So the pointing flux here is assumed to be nearly zero. Um, at the surface, we think a uh, magnetic field manufactured in the convection zone uh, rises up to the surface and powers activity in the solar corona. So the pointing flux here would act as a sink term to, to that leaks magnetic energy through the surface of the sun and powers activity in the corona, right? So this pointing flux term can only act as a sink of magnetic energy. The second term here is the uh, volume integrated uh, dissipation of magnetic energy due to resistive heating in, in the convection zone. And that again, cannot act as a storm because it's as a source of magnetic energy because it's just resistive heating, you're dissipating heat there. So the only term we're left with is the first term here. That's J cross B, the Lorentz force, times velocity, that's power, right? That's the rate of work done by Lorentz force against velocity because there's a minus sign here. So whenever Lorentz force will work against a velocity field, it will create magnetic energy. And the same term appears with an opposite sign in the equation for kinetic energy. So uh, what this is essentially doing is transforming some of the kinetic energy into magnetic energy when work is being done against the velocity field of a plasma, right? <clears throat> okay, now that we've, we, we understand that the Lorentz force working against velocity is the only possible source for magnetic energy in the interior, we can now, uh, let's look for the footprints of this Lorentz force inside the sun. Can, can, can we see this Lorentz force and can we narrow it down where this operates inside the sun? All right, let's look at the Parker's omega effect again. You, have a, you start with the polaroidal field going from south to north inside the sun and you have the differential rotation acting on this field which is curving this magnetic field and wrapping it around the sun, right? Now, this magnetic field uh, that is being curved exerts a Lorentz force that can be split into a magnetic pressure term and a magnetic tension or curvature force. And that curvature force resists this curvature in magnetic field and it will act to straighten out the magnetic field. So what it will do is it'll act against rotation at low latitudes and with rotation at high latitudes. So when sunspot forming magnetic field is being produced inside the sun, we expect the rotation at low latitudes to decelerate in time and the rotation at high latitudes to accelerate in time. This is what we expect the Lorentz force to do inside the sun. Now, <clears throat> this should be noticeable in measurements of differential rotation inside the sun. So what we can do is look at helioseismic data, which is um, through the analysis of um, uh, traveling sound waves inside the sun, uh, these um, sound waves inside the sun can be 
these measurements of traveling sound waves inside the sun can be inverted to infer, um, amongst other things, velocity of rotation inside the sun. And uh, there are uh, at least two different data series from three different instruments that we can use for this purpose. The first is the, sorry? Two minutes. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be in time. Uh, the ground-based uh, network of observatories called GONG, which has observations since 1996 to present, and another data set can be constructed by stitching together MDI and HMI rotation inversions. These, uh, you should note, are not coming from local helioseismology because we are concerned with flows that are much deeper down to the bottom of the convection zone. We're going to be using global helioseismic inversions for this purpose. All right, so the, here the left eight panels are from data um, reduced by Gong, and the right eight panels are basically essentially the same data reduced by uh, from MDI and HMR. And the plot, the colors, the blue and red colors are showing you acceleration and deceleration of rotation rate in time. The green dots here are locations of sunspots as they appear at the surface, but the contour plots, the color plots come from acceleration or deceleration at different depths inside the sun. So if you look at the top left panel here at 0.76 solar radius, during the rising phase of cycle 23, uh, you can see the low latitudes were decelerating in time, the high latitudes were accelerating in time, and the division between acceleration and deceleration lies right along um, the, the, uh, the uh, active latitudes. In the next half of the cycle, the rotation rate decelerates at high latitudes and accelerates at low latitudes to replenish the latitudinal shear in differential rotation that was lost in powering solar cycle 23. <clears throat> and you can see this pattern at depths from 0.76 solar radius up to 0.84. Uh, that's the lower half of the convection zone. Um, and above that, the density of the plasma gets so low that um, it's, it's difficult to, to understand um, the acceleration deceleration patterns and like the, their magnitude is so low that it's, it's probably not connected to the um, magnetic act, uh, the powering of uh, solar cycle in the interior. <clears throat> and you can see the same pattern, deceleration and low latitudes and acceleration at high latitudes that we expect uh, in MDI HMI rotation inversions as well, again up to a depth of 0.84. <clears throat> About that, the torsion oscillation, as we call these deviations in differential rotation, kind of go out of phase and start behaving differently. But because the density of plasma there is so low, it doesn't matter as much. <clears throat> this is the same data. Yeah, this is my last slide. This okay. is the same data that's in panels of snapshots of time instead of um, instead of butterfly diagrams. And I can have your questions now. Um, if anyone has a quick question, uh, we'll probably save most of the questions for the Q and A at the end. But if anyone has a, a quick question for Sushant, you're welcome to ask it. Uh, and if not, if you need to, some time to process, um, we can move on to our surprise speaker as advertised. Uh, I think everyone has now seen that it is Mark DeRosa. He's gonna be talking about surface manifestations of the solar cycle um, and that aspect of coffee is looking at, at it from the, the surface and downward. So go ahead, Mark. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me share my screen here. Okay, I think you should all be able to see my uh, title slide. Good. Okay, so uh, yes, I was I was uh, I was uh, asked to uh, just chat about the surface drivers aspect of of things and how it relates to to coffees. And uh, so my my talk is is basically going to uh, just be a lot of uh, fodder for thought. There's a lot of different aspects to this, and I sort of just picked two things that I find interesting. 
So uh, let's get started. Uh, I'm going to start at the same place that Sushant did, which is the butterfly diagram. And uh, you know, as you can see here, there's there's uh, you know cycles of activity as, as a function of, of time, and this just shows you know the last dozen or so uh, sunspot cycles uh, that have been observed. Um, and just to remind you that people have been looking at the sun, this is one of the great advantages of studying the sun is that we have observations going back a long time, especially compared with trying to understand dynamos in general and other stars and things like this. Uh, but this is a drawing uh, from sunspot cycle four from the late 18th century. It almost looks uh, biological. And uh, I hope everybody's had lunch, by the way. Uh, <laughs> so, and uh, just to, uh, to remind you too that this is, you know, sunspot drawings go back at least as far as Galileo. So this, this series of images here, this movie just shows sunspot drawings by him in, in the 1600s. And so, uh, by the way, you might notice here that the, the sun is, is tilted. Uh, the the, the uh, North Pole is not up. It's it's uh, either angled up to the right or down to the left, probably up and to the right, I would guess. But anyway, um, you know, this long record of, of uh, solar activity um, has a lot of uh, interesting uh, characteristics to it. And in fact, uh, you can look at proxies of magnetic activity, such as this. Uh, oh, well, so this is just the, uh, this is just the, uh, the sunspot. Uh, again, the, the modulation of the sunspot number um, as a function of time going back uh, to to Galileo, but you can look at uh, you know sort of proxies of sunspot acti of solar activity uh, from uh, things like uh, radionuclide abundances and ice cores. Uh, the radionuclide abundances measured from the ice core. So what happens is you drill an ice core and you look at the the slices, and and you know as you go down from the top, you get farther back in time because the ice has piled up over the years. And uh, just because of the fact that when the sun's magnetic field is primarily dipolar, when the dipole is strong during solar minimum, that creates a larger magnetic field that shields uh, the earth from, from cosmic rays. And as a result, the uh, abundance of certain radionuclides here, this is beryllium 10, uh, changes. Uh, and is is proportional to that shielding. And so when the shielding is high, that is when the activity level is low, then you get uh, a higher uh, abundance of this particular this particular species. And uh, you know because you know the ice has been piling up for hundreds of years, uh, you can go back a long time and get information like this where you can see the uh, activity minima, which shows up as peaks in this diagram here, really do stand out. So this is the monitor minimum here. Uh, and this is the uh, the minimum before it, the uh, Spurra minimum. And if you uh, drill down even farther, you can go back even farther in time. So this goes back, you know, tens of thousands of years. And so you can see there's a there's a uh, you know that the sun has basically been been doing this this sunspot cycle thing for a long time. Um, and while it's it's reasonably stable in this regard, we know it's not like sort of a perfect clock. So the, you know, for example, each sunspot cycle is not exactly 11 years long. It, there's some variation in that, and each sunspot cycle, you know, also has uh, you know the amplitudes of each sunspot cycle are different. And so uh, there's lots of different things, in even just the sunspot number plot that you can look at. Um, and a big question, and it's, it's one that's that's central to the focus of coffees, is basically why. Um, so as I've listed here, the cause of these modulations is, is due to any number of things. Um, there's lots of, of speculation that it has to do with, with fluctuations in the convection zone or nonlinear coupling between the different layers of the sun, or even the interaction between flux emergence and near surface shear layer. And, and understanding the these linkages is, is one of the main thrusts of coffees. Um, I'll point out that, uh, you know, sort of one way of demonstrating understanding is to be able to predict uh, upcoming sunspot cycles, which is, is one theme that many people have focused on. Um, but these various observations of the sun, which don't just include the sunspot number, but also include all these other things that I have listed here, uh, basically constrain uh, 
theories of the dynamo. So basically a theory of the dynamo, it kind of has to explain all of these different things, which include everything from Hale's polarity law to active region tilt. So active regions are tilted uh, in a particular way. Uh, there's asymmetry. If you look at active regions in general, the leading polarity is, is more coherent than the trailing polarity. Um, so that's an asymmetry and why that is, is a constraint on the, on the flux production and emergence process. And then there's things like active longitudes and clustered emergence or nests, as, as Todd mentioned. There's the evolution of the polar fields, which is going to be my next topic uh, in a second here. Um, and, and all these other things. And then there's the longer term things that I've listed down at the bottom of the slides, such as you know, the modulation of, of sunspot number across multiple cycles and correlations between various things. So all of these, all of these interesting observational, uh, observational details uh, uh, really do uh, put a lot of constraints on, on, on understanding the dynamo. So I mentioned that uh, prediction is sort, of a, is sort of a cottage industry at this point. Um, and if you wanna see how good we are, um, you can look at this diagram, which were predictions for solo cycle 24, which recently finished. Um, and so these were predictions from solar cycle 24 that happened uh, 10 plus years ago. And uh, basically you can see that they predicted everything from, from weak cycles to strong cycles. The right answer is essentially a blue line. And, and with you know, such a variety of, of predictions, you know, somebody was bound to, to be close. And, and understanding why uh, those particular methods were close. So each one of these uh, bars here is a different prediction method from a submitted from a different author. And you can go look at the Pesnell series of papers to, to get these. But I mean, you know, uh, trying to understand um, uh, whether any of these methods has predictive power is, is, a, real, is a real challenge and a, and a focus of our, of our understanding. So uh, one interesting correlation to me is the fact that polar fields uh, uh, appear to be a pretty useful indicator of the solar dynamo. Um, and so the plot on the right here is from a paper by Andres Munoz Jaramillo. And basically it shows, uh, you know, the y-axis is the, is the amplitude of the next cycle, which follows uh, a particular sunspot minimum and the polar flux during that minimum is the x-axis, and so each square or circle um, corresponds to a particular sunspot cycle. So, uh, you know, you, for example, you can see here that sunspot cycle 20, um, you know, it falls right on this correlation line. The uh, difference between the squares and the circles, incidentally, is just the northern, one is the northern hemisphere and one is the southern hemisphere. And uh, for the most part, uh, all of these, these things fall on this correlation line. And, and, you know, I think that uh, uh, going back to this, uh, uh, what Dean Pesnell calls the piano keys diagram here, uh, going back to this, you know, I think uh, many of these, these uh, methods here in this region were based on polar fields, or at least some of them were. Um, but anyway, uh, such correlations are, are mostly expected if the Bab Babcock latent dynamo mechanism, which Susant basically described, um, describes the, the solar dynamo. So we think we understand at least that part of the solar dynamo. Um, although I'll point out that, you know, sort of this is based on essentially a small number of cycles. You know, I mean, this, as mentioned before, the sun has been doing this for, for thousands of years and we've only kind of studied in detail, you know, the last, uh, what, you know, I don't know, at best dozen sunspot cycles. So, um, and we don't really have a very good measurements of the polar fields either. But, um, but as a result, I, I do think that this correlation is, is reasonably intriguing. So let me just uh, briefly talk about the formation of the polar fields. Uh, emergent bipoles, which include active regions at the, on the large end down to uh, sort of medium-sized bipoles down to ephemeral regions, um, usually uh, emerge with opposite polarities in the, in the northern and southern hemispheres. And those polarities switch from one cycle to the next, that's Hale's polarity law. And as mentioned earlier, there's a tilt. So whereas the leading polarity in each hemisphere is closer to the equator than the trailing polarity, that's Joy's law. Um, after emergence, we, ob we observe that flux uh, interacts with the surrounding area just due to the fact that these flux, the, these active regions and all of this magnetic activity is embedded in a, in a turbulent fluid. 
And there's lots of flux cancellation. There's lots of flux cancellation, flux coalescence. Um, there's you know lots of uh, sort of uh, you know it's almost like a meat grinder, but the pattern, the certain patterns persist. Um, and so even though it's it's hard to follow a particular flux concentration for a while as it interacts with the surrounding field, there's definitely patterns of flux emergence that that we we can see and that we've observed for 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 many years with uh, with the magnetograms in particular from from both MDI and HMI over the last 25 years. Um, we also have the grants from before that time, of course, but there's they're a lot less uh, a lot less frequent. But in any case, um, it does appear that photospheric flows do move the flux around. They shear the flux out, and uh, the meridional flows, in particular, move the flux forward, and more accurately, move flux patterns forward. Because as as I mentioned, it's hard to like pick out a piece of flux and follow it for a long time. The flux is always interacting with with, there's basically small scale flux everywhere outside of active regions. And flux that, that kind of gets chewn up from active regions interacts with, with this quiet sun flux quite readily. Um, there's also lots and lots of, of emergent bipoles. Uh, so on the, on the ephemeral region, basically we see flux emerging all over the sun on very small scales. The net result of these kinematic processes is that flux accumulates at the poles and and one polarity and, and each hemisphere has a has a different polarity and so that depends on on what the what what phase of the sunspot cycle you're in or I, I should say whether it's an odd or an even sunspot cycle and so sort of the most basic uh understanding is is from this diagram here uh so basically the red and the green in, indicate different polarities and as you can see on the left this is kind of a very uh, um, course uh, schematic diagram of an active region where the leading polarity in each hemisphere is closer to the equator. As mentioned, the leading polarity has a different polarity from the one in the other hemisphere. And as the active regions over time, over many months, um, active regions will, will slowly dissipate and sort of like the blob associated with each polarity of each active region will get larger until the leading polarities tend to sort of, uh, in this idealized diagram, meet at the equator, and there's some cancellation there, which, because the meridional flow is kind of always acting on, on the flux, the trailing polarity ends up with a net uh, amount of flux that the, the meridional flow transports polar over the sunspot cycle. So that is the conventional wisdom. This is sort of boiling down a lot of dynamical effects into a simple diagram, but this is how we tend to to this is how I at least tend to think of it, and when you so this can be modeled. So we we've created a two dimensional uh, photospheric surface models of flux, and uh, well, let me just show this magnetogram first. Uh, this is one. This is the, this is the same magnetogram as on my title slide, but it's a nice uh, HMI magnetogram which which shows uh, active regions in sort of different phases of of their evolution. Um, you can see like these these uh, regions of you know, all of the kind of medium-sized blobs of flux have the same polarity, um, and that's just due to the the shearing flows and the meridional flow moving the flux around um, over time. This active region down here is more recent, and so you can see uh, stronger concentrations of flux. And in fact, uh, the flux is saturated white and black uh, in this in this image. And so, as I was saying, we can sort of model the the emergence of flux and look at the polar fields. And so this is a surface flux transport model in which, okay, thank you, in which uh, active regions are, in fact, uh, bipoles of all sizes are, are, are inserted into the model and you can see them pop in. And then over time, so if you look at the date on the bottom, um, you can see you know, what happens when, when active regions that have been placed in the model um, are subject to the flows over time. And you can see, because the surface of the sun differentially rotates, you can see that, you know, the, the, uh, the higher latitudes in both hemispheres uh, are sort of sweeping, being swept to the left. And that's because they rotate more slowly than, than those at, at lower latitudes. And, and so let me just drag this cursor forward in time. So these are years of your life going by. We're all getting older, sorry, but uh, you can you can you can really see uh, that you know even as there, there's more activity, these same rules uh, actually 
lead to uh, building up of, of polar fields. And so if you remember the polar fields at the beginning of the movie, they were the different, they were different color than what's being shown here. Uh, so this is a nice plot that's on the, the HMI uh, webpage, one of the HMI webpages that just shows the formation of the polar fields during sunspot cycle 24 and into 25. And you can see these streaks of flux moving, being moved polared. Uh, over time. And if you were to measure the polar flux, um, you would see things that look like this. And so this is the, the polar fields. This is on the same web page, uh, I think, on the same web page uh, as a function of time um, from, from HMI. And so these plots on this web page, I've listed the, uh, the URL here, uh, are always being updated. So uh, um, you can uh, continue to take a look at them. But it shows uh, how the polar fields uh, switch signs over the last. Uh, last uh, 11 plus years, almost 12 years, I think. So uh, to conclude, um, the sun has exhibited cyclic magnetic activity for, for many, many years. Uh, activity levels, levels are modulated, which is probably to be expected for turbulent astrophysical dynamo. Um, polar fields appear to be useful. Um, especially uh, in order to gain insight into the solar dynamo, and they seem to have predictive power. Um, the sun, of course, you know, so I was worried that oh, there's gonna be like one wacky year when the polar fields are, are completely, completely lead us astray. You know, I, I almost feel like the sun can do whatever it wants half the time. Um, but for now, uh, I'm sticking to this idea that the polar fields have, have some predictive power. They also uh, structure the solar corona and the solar wind, which I didn't really talk about at all, but we have good observations of of the solar corona, and especially now with, with the suite of in situ measurements, uh, in particular probe and solar probe and solar orbiter, uh, we'll have uh, really nice observations of, of, of basically uh, points inside 1AU as well as uh, in situ observations of the solar wind. Um, these, many of these characteristics are dependent on the cycle phase. Uh, I didn't talk about other stars, but, um, I will say that observations and inferences of stellar polar fields, if we can ever get them, uh, especially those that possess regular activity cycles will probably help to place the solar dy dynamo in context. In fact, a lot of other stars uh, seem to have less regular dynamos, which I think is also really interesting because it, it indicates that, you know, having regular cycles is not an automatic uh, output of, of, of a stellar dynamo. So Coffees is taking a multi-pronged approach to understanding toward understanding these things. Um, and you know, there's a lot of different topics being addressed within the Coffees effort. And I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic, of course, that like everyone here, I think is that it will be selected. It's basically the only drive center that's that's trying to understand the interior and the surface. And you know, sort of like everything that's all, all of the space weather that affects the heliosphere and in particular us on Earth. You know, it all, all has its solar origin uh, on the photosphere or below. And so it's really important to understand the interior and the surface of the sun. And that's what coffee has achieved to do. And many topics are, are addressed within the coffee's, uh, coffee's efforts, such as these listed here. So let me end there with this nice movie of, of HMI mean degrams evolving in time. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mark. Um... We're going to open to questions. So you can ask questions about coffees in general, um, about solar cycle in general, or specifically um, to the points of Sushant in terms of interior manifestations or Mark in terms of surface manifestations. But real quick, um, we wanted to say a huge thank you to um, our CET member, Savannah Perez Piel, who is um, she, she is responsible for this entire event. She is the one who's been communicating with you um, to let you know um, the Zoom links and the time. She's been the one who created the flyer and advertised for us. Um, she's been coordinating the entire thing. So a huge thank you to Savannah. Um, it's, it was great. It, it went off without a hitch. Thank you so, so much. Um, so now we'll open to questions. Feel free. Um, you can use chat or just raise your hand or jump in. Um, we are at your disposal. Mike has a question? Yes, I do. Um, one of the problems I see is that 
even at solar minimum, when there are no spots, no groups, no active regions, uh, there is still a sizable interplanetary or helium magnetic field, uh, which seems to be rather constant from minimum to minimum. Um, and one problem I have, or one issue, is uh, where does that field come from? And how come that is almost uh, constant? Uh, presumably, uh, since we have observed that field for, for every minimum, uh, it was, would also have been there during the Mondo minimum. So the question is wider, namely, uh, what would uh, what would produce that uh, uh, field during a grand minimum? Uh, so that's that's. Uh, if I wonder if anybody has some comments on that. Well, maybe I can uh, say a few things or say one thing. Basically, it, it, you know, um, I think that uh, while uh, sunspots are sort of the most noticeable magnetic feature in the sun, there's lots of smaller scale things that also, uh, I think to some extent at least, maybe on, a, on a, if you take an average of them, will will follow the, the Joy's law and Hale's polarity law and may produce polar fields uh, even during uh, spotless intervals like the modern minimum. And, may, uh, the, and those fields may, may structure the, the heliosphere as you've described. I mean, uh, life, I think you already are aware that this might happen, um, having thought about this for a long time. And, uh, and so uh, that's one way out, I think. Um, yeah, uh, one problem with that explanation is that it's really hard to uh, visualize or model even how the polar fields can reach all the way down to the equator. Uh, that's stretching it, I think. So to me, that's one of the outstanding uh, problems, which I think coffee should also address. I think that's one of the things in our flux emergence and transport theme that probably needs some, some real attention. You know, we, we often concentrate on how does the flux get to the surface because, you know, sunspots are bright and shiny and make flares and stuff. But, you know, there's the, there's the corresponding question is, well, what happens to the flux when it disappears? You know, when it either closes across the equator or when it submerges from the poles or whatever happens, right? Um, you know, how does it get back to the interior? Uh, you know, is it, is it really driving it or is it just an indicator? You know, and I think all of these are really good questions that I, I'm, I think, in, ask me in five years, we'll tell you. At least that part of it. <laughs> okay, know, I, don't know, yeah. I don't know that we'll be able to, uh, to, to describe, you know, why there's a basal, uh, you know, solar wind. I think that might be a different question. Maybe, maybe it has something more to do with the near surface shear layer and the small scale flux than it does the large scale flux. Yeah. But that's sort of the next next thing. How does the flux get out into the corona and, and further out? What happens there? And that is a little bit outside of the uh, of what coffee is uh, supposed to do. That's sort of the, that's we need, a, we need yeah. a parallel uh, effort there. Well, and maybe when we get the result from the Parker and Solar Orbiter, uh, that's going to look at poles. To get a handle on that. So these are, I think, very exciting times for solar physicists. Well, and hopefully, what Coffees is trying to do it will help us towards that end. You know, I mean, knowing the the inner boundary condition of that and and the processes that are at work there, I think, will lead to um, being able to answer some of those questions more readily. So even if it's not exactly a coffee's topic at the moment, at least, um, it, it's something that we're definitely working towards. Sure. Thanks. Yeah, I've been thinking that we need a new logo, coffees and tea for terrestrial effects. We can add the tea. Yeah. That would be like awesome. <laughs> like yeah. Do we have any other questions? Uh, feel free to raise your hand, put it in chat. Open your mic, I'd love to hear from you. Especially um, early career people, students, feel free to ask questions. 
And uh, if you don't have, uh, if you, you're feeling shy, uh, you can always uh, email us or, or join our uh, coffee's newsletter. We've got the link in the chat. Uh, if you're just curious and want to learn more about uh, what coffee's does, uh, we're definitely uh, happy to, to share what we're doing with you and, and happy to uh, have you join our, our uh, info mailing list to just uh, be uh, notified when we're having seminars uh, or other public events like this. We also, um, so we have a, our coffees website and there's a lot more information if you're interested in any particular topic or any of the themes or joining one of the science teams, um, we welcome you to, to head that way and, and yeah, get involved. We're, we're refreshing our website today, so I'm not sure if it's 100% working or 80% working today. I think it's 100% <laughs> working. Okay. It's still a work in progress, so there are some pages that are um, that you'll see are, are in progress, but oh, we is have it? a question. In, yeah, go for it. Uh, we have a question in the chat. Why coffees is not linked to the earth? Uh, so I think that you're, what you're asking is, is why uh, you know, the work that coffees focus on uh, isn't specifically um, you know, focused on that sun earth interaction. And I, you know, I'll take a stab at answering that, but anybody else who might have a better answer, feel free to, to chime in. Uh, but you know, I think you know, solar physics is, is, is a very uh, broad topic. There's a lot going on in solar physics. And, uh, and traditionally, uh, a lot of that, uh, a large part of the solar physics community has focused on that sun earth connection, more directly the links between the sun and the earth. And so while coffee's science doesn't specifically uh, look at solar flares, CMEs, all these things that are traditionally associated with that area of solar physics, you know, we're, we're really you know, focused on, on more that, that underlying the roots of, of what causes uh, you know, the space weather. So unlocking what going, what's going on in the interior will better inform us about you know, what can happen uh, at the surface and then uh, come to, to reach the earth. Uh, but because there, we are, you know, have been uh, you know, somewhat separated in terms of you know, the, 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 the solar flares, the solar atmosphere, the CMEs, uh, and the solar interior. Uh, there's, just, there's just so much ground to cover. And in order to, to really take a deep dive in, in what we're most curious about in terms of the, the solar interior, the solar cycle, we really have to, to limit our scope somewhat. But uh, like I said, if, if, if Todd maybe has a better answer, feel free to, to chime in. Well, yeah, I mean, in the end, it's always about money, right? At some level in terms of what you do. And, and we wanted, I remember when we first came up with the coffee's idea of, of understanding all this, we, we, drew, we drew the line a little higher. <laughs> um, we, we didn't want to get all the way to earth necessarily, but we certainly wanted to get up into the prone in the atmosphere, which is kind of the base of the heliosphere. Um, and what we found was that there was, it brought in, you know, we had to do so much more to, to try and integrate another part of it that we, that we sort of lost, that we would have to have lost the focus on the interior. So it was, it was a choice based on, you know, how much could we do, how much resources were there, and, and where, where can we, you know, get a team together that's actually going to make some real progress, you know, within the scope of the program. And, and that was it. But yeah, we're, I think we're all interested because we all live on this star. Um, and, you know, or close to the star, and it's the one that kind of keeps us going. And mm -hmm. you know, understanding what happens there is important for you know looking forward and for understanding our own environment. So, yeah, yeah there's there's interest there. It's just a matter of you know how, where where do you draw the line? <laughs> yeah, there's also, I mean, I don't know if um, everybody had a chance to either go to or watch the recording of the um, the Parker lecture that happened yesterday, but. Um, part of what Jim Klimchuk was talking about was that there's, I mean, there's so much overlap in the physics between solar, you know, the solar physics and like earth side, more terrestrial physics, magnetospheric physics, like any of the plasma stuff, there's like dynamo implications, even for like other planetary things, there's so much crossover that um, even if we're not specifically working towards answering earth side questions, um, there's a lot that can be learned and applied from what we're doing to those other disciplines. Hi, so 
It's Amy. I have a question for Sushant, which I probably know the answer to, but I'd like to hear his answer. Mm -hmm. And that is what percentage of the torsional oscillations is directly due to the Lorentz force and what percentage of the rotational profile with depth could possibly be explained by the Lorentz force acting on deep uh, magnetic fields? So right now we don't have a quantitative answer to that. Either um, of them the, or just one of them? Uh, to how much of the torsional oscillation is due to the Lorentz force. But qualitatively speaking, the, the nature uh, of um, and, and the, the spatial temporal nature of uh, Lorentz force feedback um, is seen in the torsional oscillation profile in the lower half of the convection zone. So at this point, the best we can do is just assume that all of it is due to the Lorentz force and uh, try to get a value for how much magnetic field would be uh, produced if all of that signature is due to the magnetic field. But that involves a whole lot of assumptions and it just, it, it's, Right now we're working on it, but it's not really possible to get a realistic estimate because it just requires a whole lot of assumptions at the moment. And what about the second part um, in terms of the differential rotation profiles with depth and how they're not on cylinders and that sort of, uh, the differential rotation profile with depth, what, um, can you talk about that and the Lorentz force and the magnetic fields? So uh, the overall uh, mean rotation profile is something that would be governed by um, a combination of convection and Coriolis force. Um, and at least in the work that I've done, I haven't specifically analyzed what the mean rotation rate looks like. I've only looked at the deviations from it on the acceleration and deceleration of rotation rate. So um, I don't know a whole lot about that, but uh, what, when I showed um, um, deceleration at low latitudes and acceleration at high latitudes during the first half of the cycle, and during the second half of the cycle, we see that lost shear in differential rotation being restored. Um, so if, if, if what we think is happening is right, then the second half of the cycle observations during that second half of the cycle will give us an idea of how the differential rotation, like how the mean rotation profile of the sun is established because that would be reestablishing that shear in rotation rate during the second half of the cycle. So from those measurements, we can possibly um, try to constrain how the process that sets up differential rotation in the first place uh, works. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions at this time. So I'd like to go ahead and thank our uh, all of our speakers uh, today and all of our uh, attendees. We really appreciate you coming and, and learning about uh, coffees and uh, thank our speakers for, for wonderful talks. And uh, as I said, if you're, you're interested in learning about uh, more about coffees, feel free to, to reach out to, to any of us or uh, you know, find us on the website. We're happy to share. Yeah, and definitely, um, so we have a sessions, post, um, uh, oral sessions and um, poster sessions on Friday. So make sure you come by to see us. And we're also planning a little in for anybody who's in person, um, if anyone else is in person, we're going to have a little social gathering Friday after the last session of the meeting. So um, you can find information on Lisa or my posters. Um, and you're also welcome to email us and to get more information. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank Thanks you so for putting much, it all everyone. together. Thank you. <laughs> Good talking to you. Thank you, everyone. It was Thanks. Nice to bye. See you guys. Bye. Thank bye, you. Folks. Bye. Bye.